everybody, Tyrone TG3 here. Dragon Ball Super, Superhero. That's a title. Anyway, I know I'm late, but Dragon Ball Super, Super... Okay, okay, stop. For the sake of not losing my mind, I'm just gonna call this movie Dragon Ball Superhero. There. Anyway, Dragon Ball Superhero was released in theaters in the US in August 19th of 2022. I wanted to do a review back then, but between me moving to a new place and my new job, it was a lot to put in. Plus, I wanted to do a review that was safe enough to do without worrying about spoilers. I think four months is a good gap of time. And the movie is out on DVD and Blu-ray, so if you haven't seen it but still want to watch my review, go grab the movie, I don't know, as a late Christmas gift. Or brace yourself, because there be spoilers. My initial thoughts when this movie was announced was very, how should we say cautious as a Dragon Ball fan. I don't know, but it feels like recently when Dragon Ball has been backed into a production corner on characters lately, it feels like they always backtrack to either Sans or Androids. Need a villain? Ooh, look, Toriyama decided to bring out Broly, even though technically Broly already existed. And need a new or another villain? Ooh, look, two more Androids. Ooh, and look, it's another version of Cell. It very much feels like Dragon Ball was on the repeat train. But hey, it's more than likely because the last movie, Broly, sold really well. But I decided to give it a chance and check it out, especially later after I learned that Goku and Vegeta, while they're in the movie, their main character roles will actually take a back seat and the main characters would actually be Gohan and Piccolo for this film. Hell, that alone is worth the price of admission. If you've seen my Dragon Ball Super reviews, which are really dated by the way, on this channel, then you know how I feel about Dragon Ball Super, aka the Goku and Vegeta show. So that definitely gave me some incentive to see how they would handle putting Gohan back in the spotlight. So, did this movie exceed my expectations? Is it the new best Dragon Ball movie? Or am I just a jaded Dragon Ball fan that'll never be satisfied? Let's find out. So this movie starts off with an exposition dump of Goku's battle against the Red Ribbon Army when he was a child, for the rare few in this day and age that actually watched the OG Dragon Ball series. And, you know, I like this. Yeah, it's used to eat up time, and I did comment on how bringing back old villains several times is a big cop-out in fiction. This does, however, help show that these actions of the heroes, no matter if they're good or evil, will come back to haunt them. Usually based on misunderstandings or the passage of time. It's one of the reasons I actually like the current Sans fight against the Tuffles and Hatchack in the OVA game, and the Super Baby Vegeta saga in Dragon Ball GT. The sins of the past can't truly be erased. After that though, we see that Dr. Jiro somehow had a grandson named Dr. Hedo and the Red Ribbon Army's commander, Red, had a son named Magenta, who leads his assistant, Carmine. Now, one thing I do roll my eyes at in fiction is the trope, the villain had a grandson slash son the whole time. Besides the implication that this guy fucks, and yes, I'm aware of Android 16 and Android 21 because of the whole Dragon Ball Fighters thing, it also makes the fictional world in this place feel small. I have no problem with the idea that there could have been a scientist who idolized Dr. Jiro and was inspired to build androids and thus became a prodigy. That feels a lot more comfortable and less like an odd coincidence. Like everybody happens to be related to somebody. Moving from that though, it's shown that Carmaine has been visiting the prison regularly because he heard that Dr. Hedo was arrested for creating undead grunts to work at a convenience store. And that is hilarious. Magenta wants to revive his army, because as of now, they're hiding in plain sight as a pharmaceutical company. They didn't even bother to change the logo. Who's their graphic designer? Come on, man, put in some effort. Magenta and Carmaine pay Dr. Hedo's bail and propose a deal with him in order to build androids capable for their plans to work. They threaten the guy at first, but Dr. Hedo quickly has defensive plans for such events. So Magenta tries a different approach by trying to bribe Dr. Hedo with Oreos. Nah, seriously. Uh, what he does do, though, is convince Dr. Hedo that they're a team of good guys fighting against Bulma at Capsule Corp, who they feel is planning to build an army of aliens, as evidenced by footage of them that they took of the Dragon Ball Z warriors in past battles. How meta. Also, between them spying on Goku in other past fights, and Dr. Jiro doing the very same thing, how many cameras were present in past battles? It's an ass pull, yes, but it does raise the question. After the deal is done, however, they agree to work together and we get a six-month time skip. 
whole Dragon Ball never change with your disregard of time. I will say as an intro to a Dragon Ball movie, I'll definitely commend them for giving us the time to really sit and absorb, sorry for the pun, the antagonist. It really lets us know who we're dealing with and understand their notions and intentions a lot more. It stops them from being just bland bad guys whose sole motivation is to take over the world. After six months have passed, we're introduced to Pan, who's now three years old. Aww. As she trains with Piccolo, not knowing how to fly yet, Pan asks about her father, Gohan, and his powers. Piccolo states that Gohan has the potential to surpass Goku and Vegeta, but lacks the training. After that chat, Pan heads to kindergarten, where Piccolo gets a call to pick her up at the end of the day by Videl. It's fun to know, we finally know what Videl does. Dragon Ball does that thing usually with mothers and wives, or what they do is kind of up in the air for a bit, unless they have a definite job or title. Turns out, she's in charge of a martial arts school. They're headed to a tournament that day, hence why Videl can't get Pan. Gohan, on the other hand, could get Pan, which Piccolo points out, but is too busy doing research. Uh, something about a Super Saiyan ant? Jesus. Piccolo scalds Gohan on his lack of discipline, but Gohan shrugs it off and keeps to the bugs. Now, I want to talk about this back and forth treatment they give Gohan when it comes to his work life and his fighting life. So, within most of Gohan's life in Dragon Ball, Toriyama loves to put this social barrier on Gohan where he has to choose between fighting and work, as if he can't do both. I mean, I get the trope, there's only so much time in the day to focus on one major thing and we're only human. But that's just it, Gohan isn't human. He's got extraordinary power and the show implies that he's a genius. I see no reason why he can't do both. Hell, in the Majin Buu arc, his home is miles away from Orange Star High School, but he can fly, so it's no problem. He's never really been chained down by societal limits. So why does the show, and Toriyama by that matter, feel like they need to make this an issue? Yes, it makes them more realistic, but as an audience on the outside looking in, it feels as though they're not effectively using Gohan in the way that scratches both itches. The show even alluded to Gohan wanting to be stronger to protect those that he cares about, as evidence to him becoming the great Saiyan man. And even before that, when he was enrolling in an Orange Star High School fighting bank robbers as the gold fighter. Yet the show keeps running back on this Gohan has his nose in the books too much joke. It feels weirdly inconsistent and back and forth. After Piccolo, and I guess my own, disappointment, he's attacked by an android known as Gamma 2. Now, when Gamma's 1 and 2 were announced, I didn't really care for them basically for the reason I stated before. About how they come off to me as, oh, two more androids. But seeing them in action now, I like them. Specifically, Gamma 2. I like that while they are androids created by Dr. Hedo, he creates them with some love and flair. Gamma 2 calling Piccolo by his Demon King alias. And I like his attacks, how they have these manga slash comic book automatopias behind them. It's funny as hell and I adore it. Gamma also has a great little bro big bro relationship with Gamma 1. He's also cool with the entire Red Ribbon Army on a social level. I like him. Uh oh. That means something's gonna happen to him, doesn't it? After Piccolo barely survives the attack, he tracks Gamma 2 and Wakanda, I mean the Red Ribbon Army's base underground, to learn that Magenta and Dr. Hedo plan to revive the Red Ribbon Army and unleash a monster known as Cell Max. It's Cell again, but you know, maxed. Whatever that means. Piccolo retreats to grab Sensu Beans and contact Boma so that she can break the in case of emergency call Goku and Vegeta glass. But for the sake of forcing Piccolo and Gohan to assume main roles in this movie, the movie traps Goku and Vegeta in a non-relevant plot B situation. To help train Broly to have him have control over his powers, Goku and the others are training on Beerus' planet. Goku asks Vegeta why he's meditating, you know, despite the fact that Goku's done it several times in the past, and I would argue that Goku has a lot more understanding of mind and body control than Vegeta, but regardless of my complaints, Whis wants Goku and Vegeta to fight with no transformations or techniques, which is... Okay, I'm just gonna say it all now. I cannot stand the Goku and Vegeta side plot. Honestly, you could have taken this out of the movie altogether, and I would not have cared in the slightest. Did the movie have to meet a Goku and Vegeta screen time quota? Why is this plot here? I guess to inform us that Broly's training and thus can be a part of the cast later, I guess? It's there to explain why Goku and Vegeta can't help with the current threat as well too, I guess? Which, by the way, is because Goku and Vegeta had a fight, and while they're fighting, Whis, Beerus, along with Chi Lai and Limo are eating ice cream from a tub. 
and the tub of ice cream then ends up covering Weiss's staff, so he can't see that Bulma's calling him. <sighs> also, the reason Beerus hasn't killed Chi Lai and Limo yet is because he likes Limo's cooking and thinks Chi Lai is. <laughs> Yeah, anyway, the whole plot is dumb. To me, it's a giant distraction. It feels like a throwaway fan service that goes nowhere. A case in point, Goku and Vegeta in their battle, air quotes, with Goku falling seconds before Vegeta and Vegeta claiming he's the winner. It's pathetic. Even Beerus, Whis, and Chi Lai don't care. They are where I am mentally during this whole section. It was simply made to give the fans something to talk about after the movie, and it means nothing. So back to the stuff that matters. When Piccolo preps for the threat, he grabs some sensu beans and visits Dende. Piccolo wants his power unlocked like Guru did for Gohan and Krillin back on Namek. Gotta say, I love the Z callbacks. But Dende tells him he's not old enough to do that yet. Which, how does that process work? Does he have to learn it, or is it like a birthday thing? Happy birthday, Master Dende. <laughs> what is happening to you? Dende says that while he can't unlock hidden power, the dragon Shenron can. But isn't the dragon tied to him? I thought Shenron can only do things the Guardian could do. Like when they tried to kill Vegeta and Nappa before they arrived on planet Earth while using the Dragon Balls. Only to be told by Kami they can't because the dragon can't do things that exceed above Kami himself. I'm guessing it's because while Dende is the current guardian, the dragon itself was still made by Kami and Piccolo when they were still fused as one. See, I love Dragon Ball lore and the Dragon Ball's creation as well as the God of Earth lore, but Toriyama seems to drop the ball, pun intended, a lot when establishing rules on the position of gods and its effect on the Dragon Balls. What's worse, in order to get the Dragon Balls to perform this wish, Dende has to sort of just pour water on the dragon statue. And while I'm guessing this is considered a gag on how the big ritual to update the dragon is reduced to just a small task, it does sort of come off lazy. What's worse, when Piccolo gets to Capsule Corp to retrieve the Dragon Balls and make the wish, we learn that Bulma's been using the Dragon Balls to change her body slightly to look younger, much like her desires in Dragon Ball Super Broly. Piccolo wishing for more power feels sort of lazy too. When it came to wishes, when it comes to the fighters, the fighters never really wish to become stronger. I always thought it was because they followed like an unwritten code, like it'd be an insult to their pride as fighters or something. But here, Piccolo has no problem with it. And sadly, this is to give the audience a visual explanation on Piccolo's upgrade, because, you know, no one could possibly just understand that Piccolo's been training seriously for all these years. So the Dragon Balls become tangible ways to show progress, I guess. Gotta sell toys somehow. Look, 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 look! Bulma's got a big booty! Everyone praise! Yay! I'm mixed on that, too. While Bulma uses the Dragon Balls for selfish gain before, I always liked that as she got older, she was making a lot more responsible wishes. Like in the Boo Saga, she makes it an effort to wish back the people that her husband killed when he was still controlled by Bobbity's magic. Her wishing for a bigger backside at this point in the story, while it is petty, I guess it does fit the humorous side that Toriyama's going for for this movie. So I'll regretfully give it a pass, especially since later on she does play a lot better of a role in the movie. Piccolo version 2.5, now with upgrades, goes back undercover in order to find out that the Red Ribbon Army plans to kidnap Gohan's daughter Pan and trap her to defeat the Warriors. Piccolo uses this as an opportunity to get Gohan fired up, so he stages a kidnapping by tagging along with the Red Ribbon Army grunt. When Piccolo takes Pan, who immediately recognizes Piccolo's key but somehow Gohan doesn't, what the f- He tells Pan to play along with him and for the sake of the kidnapping, even cry so the recording can be heard by Gohan, signaling him to come to the base. This, uh, this is, I don't like it, I'm sorry, I get it. The stakes are supposed to be lower, and I even like the idea of Gohan getting involved due to misunderstanding. But Piccolo is on full on toxic mode here. Everyone comments on how Goku's such a bad dad and Piccolo is way better. Tell me, when's the last time Goku faked a kidnapping just to get Gohan to fight again? Yeah, he sends Gohan to a fight with Cell and even gives Cell a sensu bean. But in those situations, Gohan's still an able and willing participant. He shows up to the Cell games like everyone else and knows the stakes. Yeah, Goku doesn't tell him about his hidden power, but that hardly makes a difference considering that Gohan had to be pushed there emotionally for it to come out. 
Telling him would have done nothing but put immediate pressure on him to perform. Plus, he kind of knows by this point. This, however, is miles worse. Gohan's child, a three-year-old, is taken to people that she doesn't know and is left there by Piccolo. Also, Piccolo can go, hey, Gohan, get off your ass and fight in this fake scenario I made up so you could be back to your old self again. I praise the resourcefulness and spotlight Piccolo is getting up to this point because Dragon Ball was definitely pushing Piccolo back in the years. But this is the worst thing he's done. The setup of Dr. Hedo thinking that he's the hero making superhero androids for the sake of justice only to be a pawn in the villain's plan for world conquest is a great setup for misunderstood conflict between our heroes and the antagonist. I applaud it. But Piccolo learns all the details with his knowledge, twists the plot into his direction for his selfish gain, and I hate that. It feels forced. I know I'm Monday night quarterbacking here, but I can't help but feel there was a different way to spin this plot that doesn't make Piccolo come off as a forceful jackass. I was thinking Piccolo could, while talking with Dende and then later Bulma, for almost forget that he has to go pick up Pan. So he rushes to the school only for the teacher to tell him that he already came to pick Pan up. Piccolo, realizing that's impossible, immediately gets suspicious and rushes back to the base, only to find out that Gamma 1 can disguise himself as Piccolo, based on the footage that he analyzed when Gamma 2 fought Piccolo earlier that same day. Once Piccolo uh, sees Pan kidnapped, he rushes to inform Gohan. Once Gohan hears of this information, they both rush to the base. While headed there, then Piccolo can make his inner monologue comment of going, now Gohan can get back into gear. That is a way better solution. Now my guess is they wanted to give Piccolo and Pan more cute more moments by forging this kidnapping. Personally, I feel it would have been great if Gamma 1 disguised this Piccolo and got some moments here. The humor potential is there since unlike Gamma 2, Gamma 1 is the straight man. This could have caused for a whole bunch of potential jokes. And this also could have changed the perspective of Gamma 1 on which side he should be fighting on by the time the fighting starts. Speaking of which, Gohan's at the base. So the fighting starts. Gamma 2 tries to intervene in the fight, but Piccolo fights him. And while Piccolo got a new form, he still gets his ass kicked, so the movie decides he needs another new form. An orange Cheeto Piccolo is born, because Shinron gave him a little extra. Which, I, I gotta say... What does that mean exactly? Piccolo wanted his full powers unlocked. How, how do you extra that? What's the unit of measurement? What's being powered up? His key? Is it more than his body can hold? Is it his muscular strength? If so, does unlocking his potential mean it's at max, right? How do you extra that? You see, if you think about this for more than a second, it makes zero sense. I don't power scale in Dragon Ball because I know it leads usually to nowhere. But I only ask because the movie made a big deal that Piccolo get stronger. More than likely, it was trying to keep up with the current threat. And they wanted to give the kids something to compare and contrast to and discuss on YouTube videos. As well as DLC for video games and physical flair to sell toys and merch. Anyway, after Piccolo's merch selling display, Gohan and Gamma 1's fight ends rather anticlimactically once Gamma 1 learns the truth of Magenta's intentions. At this point, Dr. Hedo is no longer keen on the idea of helping someone who's clearly evil and goes to shut down the Cell Max project, but then is stopped by Magenta. They have a brief squabble and Dr. Hedo poisons Magenta. Jesus, man, I thought you wanted to be a hero. Anyway, with Magenta being poisoned, his last dying breath, he frees the incomplete Cell Max. We go back to our heroes and find Bulma brought Goten, Trunks, 18, and Krillin, which she dubs the strongest warriors on Earth and Krillin. Now, as much of a chuckle as that got out of me, thank you, Monica Rial. Great meeting and working with you at Fan Expo. I hope to see you again. You're awesome. I can't help but feel this joke was a little off for Bulma. I mean, I know that Bulma's joked with Krillin before, but she's never really joked about Krillin's prowess. That seems like something the fans do more than her. Regardless, it's good to see that the cast are actually being used instead of just standing in one spot and watching Goku and Vegeta do all the fighting. We also get some fun dialogue exchanges like Goten's comment on how he grew and Gohan stating that Saiyans have a large growth spurt, Gohan's eyesight getting worse but apparently he can turn Super Saiyan to fix it. Interesting stuff. Oh, and then Cell Max shows up and attacks. Now what do I think of Cell Max? 
I bet a lot of people were thinking, oh, here we go. They shamelessly reused an old Dragon Ball Z villain to pull in an audience. Tyrone's going to be so mad. And looking at the promotional material, yeah, I was pretty annoyed until I saw him in action. And then I got to say, I'm not as upset as I thought I'd be. The movie knows full well what Cell Max is, and I think we're on the same page here. I have no problem with Cell Max's character, because he's not a character. In this movie, he's more of a force of nature. He's the result of science being used and made for revenge and malice. He gets no speaking lines, he only exists to destroy, and since he's given no real orders or motive, he's really just a beast. And I was curious about the fact that Cell Max was in his semi-perfect form instead of his incomplete first form or his perfect form. Then I thought about it. Out of all the forms, this one's the one that fits him the best. Remember, in Dragon Ball Z, semi-perfect form Cell's the one that threatens to blow up each island until he finds Android 18. He's also the one that threatens to blow himself up when he's losing to Gohan. Out of all of the forms of Cell, semi-perfect Cell is the least intelligent and has the shortest fuse. He's not sneaky like the first form Cell, or confident and cold like the perfect form one. So it makes sense that Cell Max visually looks like this monstrous version. I applaud them for this. Dr. Hedo explains that Cell Max has a weakness. I love that too. Yes, it does seem rather video gamey, but I'm glad that he's not just like Cell and able to regenerate from practically anything. There's a tangible target and a weakness. This allows for the heroes to fight Cell in more coordinated fashion. You got some fighters buying time, you got other fighters fighting from a distance, some fighting head on, a Goten and Trunks failing to do the fusion, don't worry I didn't forget about that. It's cool to see so many approaches to this one objective. We even get Gamma 2 sacrificing himself, which I gotta admit made me a little upset, mostly because I wish we had a little bit more time with Gamma 2 before they straight up kill him off. But hey, they actually commit to Gamma 2's death, which I'm rather impressed. It's rare to see Dragon Ball actually move forward with the death, especially since, you know, death can be sort of fixed in mere seconds in this series. But they did it, and they didn't bring him back. Good on you, superhero. But seriously, I love the strategy and approach of this battle. After all of these one-on-one -on -one bouts, it's good to see the Z-Warriors use their head to work through a problem rather than just fighting and screaming and changing their hair different colors and beating the enemy to win the fight. So anyway, after that we cut to Gohan screaming and changing his hair a different color and beating the enemy to win a fight. Gohan Beast. I woke up in beast mode. Why is it even called that? Now, I'm going to make it very clear. I don't care for transformations in Dragon Ball anymore. That lost all meaning to me after Super Saiyan 2. Super Saiyan God was a nice breath of fresh air until I saw that they made Super Saiyan Blue. Then I quickly rolled my eyes back in place. So I'm super indifferent to tacking on yet another toy seller form, especially since Piccolo got two already in this movie. My main issue isn't the transformation though, it's the way Gohan enters it. So you may have thought that I skipped the scene, but I didn't. The resulting Cell Max destruction causes Pan to almost fall until Krillin tells Pan she has to fly and she does. And she's safe. Again, I know I'm Monday Night Quarterbacking, but still, this is another missed opportunity. I was hoping those plots could have intertwined in some way. The movie makes it an effort to tell us that Pan can't fly, so I was thinking, okay, Pan will fall, Gohan will see her fall, but only the falling part, and that vision alone, like a father seeing his child in danger, would unlock the transformation. A crisis involving Pan, especially considering when Gohan heard his daughter was kidnapped, and when he thought she was hurt caused him to rage out before. In this movie, the trigger for Gohan transforming is seeing Piccolo almost killed, which... I hate to be so insensitive, but... so? Gohan's witnessed Piccolo die and almost die before. Yes, he's raged out about it too, but this is too common of a trope to get him fired up now. A father getting emotional after seeing his daughter almost fall into her death is a much more relatable and emotional trigger to me personally. And you're probably thinking, wow, Tyrone, you want Pan to fall? That's dark. No, I think it would have been nice if Pan fell and Gohan rages. And after the fight is resolved, we see that Pan was able to fly at last minute. This would not only have tied those two plot bows together, 
But it can also show that earlier when she was trying to fly, it can come back to it. And it could be a nice little nod to her grandfather Goku, how he learned how to fly in the Tenkaichi Budokai in the OG Dragon Ball series. Oddly enough, when he fought Piccolo. Imagine Pan being able to fly just at the right moment, when everybody thought that she didn't survive, only for her to have learned the move at the right time. But hey, that's what happens, I guess. Oh, I gotta talk about the form itself. It looks stupid. I get what they were going for. They wanted to recreate that Super Saiyan 2 thing again, but on Adult Gohan, it just looks really silly. I think they should have come out more with the hair going out instead of focusing on the hair going up. Now, it looks like that Kids Next Door parody. But hey, I guess they gotta sell toys somehow. Funny enough, when I see this form in video games, it looks a lot better design-wise. So after transforming, Gohan fires a special beam cannon, or Makankos and Po if you're annoying, straight to sell Max's dome, and the day is saved. Dr. Hedo and Gamma 1 are about to turn themselves in, but Boma hires them at Capsule Corp, since Dr. Hedo's science is impressive and Gamma 1 can serve as extra muscle. Piccolo's proud of Gohan, Gohan's happy to be with Pan, and the boys try to do the fusion again for some reason. All's well that ends well. And that was Dragon Ball Super, Super Hero. This is definitely a Toriyama movie. He plays to his strengths here, which at its core is humor. Toriyama likes gags and jokes, and you can feel the love that he put in. But you can also feel the standard Dragon Ball tropes that reared their ugly heads to pull in the audience. I'm impressed on some ends, and I'm sighing at others. I like the use of the cast and how no one feels like they're a waste here. Like when Krillin tells Piccolo to use his growth technique to match sale and size. Everyone has a part, and that's what I love is when the cast is used. The plot is sadly stitched together mostly by Piccolo's strings weaving to fabricate a false danger. I'm sorry, as much as I like Piccolo in this movie, the main thing I hold against him is that. Gohan is the main character, but I can't help but feel, thanks to Piccolo, he's shoved into this role rather than allowed to get there gradually. Goten and Trunks are here, and they fail the fusion. But I never liked fusion characters anyway, so it's good that they didn't succeed, or else I feel like the whole movie's focus would have been on Gotenks and would have stole Gohan's spotlight. I'm guessing they're saving the fusion for the Goten and Trunks manga series? Who knows? The plot B with Goku and Vegeta that I didn't want to bring up again is the weakest aspect of the movie. Thankfully it's not long and the post credits to me is a joke. Not meant to be anything taken seriously, but you know how Dragon Ball community is about obscure shit. Overall, it's still good, entertaining, and a nice film. And while personally, I didn't buy it, I think it would make for a nice piece of a Dragon Ball collection for fans. Out of the four Dragon Ball movies that came out in the last nine years, ugh, has it really been nine years? This is my second favorite Dragon Ball movie, beating Broly and definitely beating Resurrection F, and only being beaten by Dragon Ball Z Battle of Gods. But hey, I'm just some dude on the internet. But what are your thoughts? Did you like it? Did you hate it? Let me know in the comments. And while you're down there, check out that like button. You can look at it. Hell, click it if you want to. But hey... I had a great time reviewing this, and I hope you all have a good time too. And if you want to keep up with the good times with me, check out my Twitch channel, where I stream a variety of games like Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, Sonic, Mario, and others on Tyrone underscore TG3. Want to keep up with those streams? Follow me on Twitter under the same name, Tyrone TG3. That being said, happy holidays or whatever time of day it is during the year. And Tyrone TG3 out. <laughs>